Thank you, Gary. Well, it's a very exciting time to be involved in IBD therapeutics. And our journey with the biologics started in 1992, a long time ago, when Sander van der Vendor had the courage to treat uh, a colleague's daughter with Crohn's disease, age 14, with CA2, which was infliximab, and well, the rest is history. And those of you who grew up during this time recognize that the difference that this has made to patients' lives. Now, having said that, we have come a long way, but we need to go farther. And uh, we all recognize in clinical practice the limitations of TNF antagonists. Uh, they're good drugs, but this isn't GERD. We don't have 90% um, success rates. We need to go better and get patients off steroids to a higher degree. And furthermore, uh, TNF antagonists are systemic immune suppressives, and that comes with the burden of infection. And these are showing data from the TREAT registry, which identified that infliximab, along with exposure to prednisone, narcotics, and disease activity, were independent risk factors for developing serious infections. So we can do better, and we should think about better agents. And really, when you look at TNF antagonists and the risks of infection, there's one trademark item that stands out. And that is if you look at any TNF antagonist, irrespective of the indication, irrespective of the agent, and you go down the product monograph and you look at adverse events, you look at the point estimate and the 95% confidence intervals, and it's always upper respiratory tract infection that stands out. There's a difference between it and placebo. Well, you could say, Brian, like, who cares? I don't care if my patient gets a common cold, more likely. But that's really the canary in the coal mine for this, which is lobar pneumonia, which is the most common cause of mortality in patients receiving TNF antagonists. So these are systemic immune suppressives. They affect immunity and upper respiratory tract infection. And lobar pneumonia is really the, the problem, ultimately. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, adhesion molecule biology. Bruce did a great job of setting the stage for this, and I'm going to touch on the mechanisms a little bit. I'm going to review efficacy data for the agents we have available and some of the horizon agents that are coming. And then uh, I'll actually do what I'm supposed to do and talk about positioning in the last couple slides. Uh, you've seen this slide before. It's a complex molecular process that governs trafficking of white blood cells into tissue. And really, white blood cell trafficking is integral to immune function. Uh, we don't have an immune system without white blood cells moving from mucosal surfaces to regional lymph nodes into the systemic circulation and then back into the target organs. So, simple concept. And I, I think. When you're talking to patients, this is a concept, it's a complicated slide, but it's an easy concept for patients to understand. You're blocking the bad guys from getting into tissue. It's like the driver in the th three-lane highway. In normal state of affairs, they stay in the circulation. Tissue's inflamed, they take the off-ramp, they get into the tissue, and what we're trying to do is block that process, and it only works in the gut. So patients get that right away, and. Oddly enough, if you can convince the patient of what you're trying to do, they really are your partner in therapy. So it's an important concept. And, um, you know, I think when this all started, maybe 10, more than 10 years ago, we were concentrating on how lymphocytes get into tissue, but I don't think many people were thinking how they get out of tissue. And it's only recently with the S1P1 agonists that we've started to think that there's another side of the coin uh, that uh, we can actually interfere with this trafficking process by blocking egress of lymphocytes from regional lymph nodes. And I'll briefly talk about that. So Bruce alluded to the integrins and um, simplistically we can think of these as coming in two flavors, alpha-4 beta-1 heterodimers and alpha-4 beta-7 heterodimers and these are expressed on peripheral T lymphocytes. And they integrate with their ligands. Alpha-4, beta-1 is the ligand for VCAM. VCAM is the ligand for alpha-4, beta-1. And MADCAM is the ligand for alpha-4, beta-7. Alpha-4, beta-7 is expressed in about 3% of your circulating T lymphocytes. And that's the gut homing mechanism. 
And the story really started with this molecule, natalizumab, which is anti-alpha-4. So it will block alpha-4, beta-7 interactions and alpha-4, beta-1 VCAM interactions. And therein lies its um, weakness and its strength. So blocking alpha-4, you would block T-cell trafficking to every vascular bed in the body. Uh, and that's great uh, at one level, but it's highly non-selective. And that's where we got into the problem with PML. Certainly, natalizumab was a great maintenance drug. Um, certainly, we saw better steroid sparing effect than any of the agents that we've had to date with this drug. But ultimately, we paid the price with PML. And PML was caused because anti-4 blockade resulted in decreased T cell surveillance in the central nervous system, which led to reactivation of JC virus and uh, this very serious opportunistic infection. And we now recognize that if you can treat with natalizumab if you're JC virus serology negative, but it certainly had a chilling effect on the development of this whole class of drugs. But we persisted in recognizing that blockade of alpha-4 beta-7 was not the same as blocking alpha-4, and we moved on to vetalizumab. And the story really started with the primate model, and I, I think if you go over in the park here, you can see these little creatures, cotton-topped tamarins, and it was really this early experience in the animal model that led to the development of vetalizumab and moved on to phase three trials. <clears throat> and I'm showing the results of the Gemini 1 study, which was really one of the largest studies ever conducted in ulcerative colitis. These are the induction results and our classic endpoints of response, remission, and mucosal healing with clear superiority of the drug over placebo in a population of patients, approximately 40%, who had failed uh, TNF antagonists. So a really striking effect. And the story got even better when we looked at maintenance therapy. And um, really, as clinicians, you recognize what you want to do is get the patient off steroids for long term. And here we saw really the signature of this whole class of drugs is really a very strong corticosteroid sparing effect in ulcerative colitis. So based on these data, I think you can say this trial was conducted in both patients naive to TNF antagonists and those that failed this class of agents, and we see this very strong effect. So this is a first-line therapy for ulcerative colitis. Now Crohn's disease, this Gemini 2 study, uh, herein lies the start of the controversy. Is vetalizumab an inductive agent? And you can see on the left-hand bar the uh, remission rates, a doubling in the active treatment group versus placebo, but the actual rates at six weeks were relatively low. And actually, paradoxically, no difference in response rates. This led to huge controversy over whether the drug was even effective in Crohn's disease, but I think we should have known a little bit about this. Then when this trial was designed, we were absolutely paranoid about placebo rates in Crohn's disease, and we knew one thing, that the earlier you went for an endpoint, the better off you were. Placebo rates tended to rise with time, and if you went at six weeks, you were better off at 12 or 16 weeks. Um, we should have also been aware that natalizumab as an induction agent at six or eight weeks was not very good. 10 or 12 weeks, you're looking better. So the takeaway message for cl clinicians, there certainly is an effect of this drug as induction, but it's better at a 14-week endpoint. Don't give up on the drug. Give corticosteroids. Get it through the induction phase because it, when you come out the other side of the pipeline, you get this. And again, look at the steroid sparing effect. This is a highly effective steroid sparing effect that is well tolerated over the long term and as I'll come to, is a very safe uh, therapy for your patients. So what about safety? So the promise of vetalizumab really is long-term safety because of its selective immune suppression in the gut. And this is an overview analysis uh, published recently in Gut by John Frederick Columbell. And um, we were very interested in comparing the integrated safety data with the vetalizumab trials, both in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and comparing them to placebo. And what you have to do in these sort of analysis uh, is look at actually events per patient, 100 patient years, because you have to adjust for exposure. If you're, the advantage of a placebo controlled trial is you have a concurrent, contemporaneous 
uh, comparator. The disadvantage is that placebo patients tend to drop out. They don't survive in these analyses as long as patients on active drug. So you have to adjust for follow-up, and that's where your patient year follow-up uh, analysis comes through. And um, we had fully expected that, based on the mechanism, that vedolizumab would have approximately the same rate as placebo in these analyses. And I'm just showing you, and remember what I said about the signature of TNF antagonists with regard to infection, upper respiratory tract infection, the canary in the coal mine. And what we see in these analyses, look at the point estimates for upper respiratory tract infection and similar uh, things like um, any infection and lower respiratory tract infection. The point estimates for vedolizumab are in fact lower and in some cases the 95% confidence intervals don't overlap, they're actually lower than placebo. Well, how can that be? Well, think of your last patient that got infected on a TNF antagonist. What did that patient look like? Well, they were malnourished, they were on corticosteroids, they had active disease. And you can imagine that if you give someone an effective therapy and you drive more patients into remission, the rate might be lower. So this is very powerful evidence of why vedolizumab is really a transformational drug. There are other, um, as Bruce alluded to, other targets. So you can block beta-7, you can block MADCAM. And we have preliminary data in ulcerative colitis in a phase two with etrolizumab. This blocks beta-7, so it will block alpha-4 beta-7, block the, the heterodimer beta-7 component. And this is a phase two study showing efficacy with etrolizumab. Etrolizumab will also, however, block alpha-E beta-7. And you know when your pathologist shows you those beautiful pictures of intraepithelial lymphocytes? They're tethering to the molecule E cadherin, which is present on the basement membrane of epithelial surfaces. And that is an alpha E beta 7 E cadherin interaction, which an antibody to beta 7 will block. Now, we don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing right now. Uh, you could argue that you could see enhanced efficacy by blocking this additional mechanism, but it is less selective than blocking alpha 4 beta 7. And could you see an increased side effect profile because of? the presence of alpha E beta 7 E cadherin interactions in things like the skin and the lung. So this remains to be seen, this molecule's in phase three. And then blocking MADCAM, uh, why go to the final common pathway, cut out the middleman. We have data from this study, which Bruce showed, of this paradoxical dose response curve with this molecule, which is moving into phase three, blocking MADCAM. So really this mechanism is now well established um, and we reviewed the data in a recent Cochrane review, and if you look down these um, pedograms, the uh, forest plots, you see that the effect size for induction of remission across all three agents is very similar, uh, clearly better than placebo, and just validates the whole class as an induction drug in Crohn's disease, and also colitis. Very little data in Crohn's disease. Um, again, anti madcam really has failed in the situation, and I would draw your attention to the high placebo response rates. Hard to explain in this trial. This trial took the usual steps to reduce placebo rate, but um, did not show an effect. So this um, remains to be seen where this is going, ultimately. Uh, I would say, though, that in subgroup analysis of that trial, if you selected patients who had high inflammatory burden, you could tease out a um, post hoc effect. So I'm not saying that this doesn't work, it's just that it's not clear to me where this is going at the present time. Bruce alluded to the sphingosine uh, phosphate 1 agonist as a new approach of lymphocyte trafficking, and we have data with, azonim, with originally the prototypic model, fingolimod has been a breakthrough drug, oral agent, in MS. It has a large um, side effect profile, there's a number of problems with the drug, and a more selective version recently, Ozonimod, published by Bill Sanborn in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed this very nice result in refractory patients, uh, clear dose response with the one milligram dose um, showing efficacy in induction, and in a follow-up study showing increased efficacy over a period of 22 weeks. So this molecule is now going into phase three in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease as an oral agent, which won't have the burden of uh, parenteral administration and risk of immunogenicity that encumber 
the uh, monoclonals. So in the last four minutes, I'm going to get to what I was really asked to do, and that's talk about positioning. So when I was growing up as a resident, we said that azathioprine was the cure to all our ills, and that ultimately it would be the agent that would transform the natural history of disease. When this study came out by Jacques Cohn, uh, we began to change our view. So this shows the rise of azathioprine therapy in a single teaching hospital in Paris, France, over a period of 20 years, and you see this rise in the use of azathioprine, but no parallel decrease in surgery rates. So that's when we started to challenge the view that it was a transformational drug. And then more recently, larger clinical trials than the old studies by Candy Wright or Dan Present have evaluated this. This is a French Jetaid study showing no benefit for azathioprine monotherapy, confirmed by the, uh, the sorry, that was the Azat. Aztec trial. This is the Jetate study again showing no benefit for monotherapy. So if you take this into Crohn's disease, what does it tell us? The pyramid is dead. The base of the pyramid, 5-ASA and antibiotics, they don't work. Corticosteroids, short-term induction therapy, azathioprine, our go-to transformational drug, really has been, uh, the emperor has no clothes. So we've really got away from step care now in 2016. And now it's we're really categorizing patients into either high-risk patients or low-risk patients. The high-risk patients, and you know who they are, there's a variety of clinical predictors that you all use, they need the most effective therapy early in the course of the disease. Everyone else um, needs careful observation and um, follow-up. And clinical trials started to reflect this approximately 10 years ago. This was the top-down therapy that compared early combined immunosuppression to conventional step care and showed that not only was it more effective for control of symptoms, but in fact mucosal healing was better and in a follow-up study, surgery rate and hospitalizations were actually better. Uh, the question remained though, could you do early combined immunosuppression in community medicine? And this was a very important study that we had the privilege of being involved with, the REACT study. This was uh, looking at evaluating early combined immunosuppression in the community, um, comparing almost um, 2,000 patients followed for up to two years assigned to either usual care or combined immunosuppression. And what we demonstrated was that in the patients who received early combined immunosuppression, even in a low-risk patient population with long-standing disease duration, that we could show a difference in the big ticket items over a two-year period with the strategy. So you can imagine if you took high-risk patients early in the disease, what the effect would be. I would speculate that it would be better. So we've heard, um, you're going to hear Bill talk about ustekinumab, the new kid on the block, and I was asked about positioning. I'll start with a disclaimer, there are no direct head-to-head -head comparisons. And I don't like making indirect comparisons, but I'll try a little bit. Um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, induction and maintenance for all of these agents, they're all good drugs. Having said that, I showed you the data with vedolizumab and perhaps in the short term, it's not as effective induction agent as USTA or um, TNF antagonist. Certainly safety, this is where vedolizumab shines. And I showed you the data from the integrated safety data. It's really hard to compete. We don't have a lot of long-term experience, obviously, with ustekinumab in Crohn's disease, but we have a lot of experience in psoriasis. And it's a very safe drug. And um, maybe Bruce could uh, tell us why it's a safe drug, given we block both TH1 and TH17 pathways. I don't think anyone knows the answer to that one. Uh, rapidity of onset. Again, TNF antagonists are hard to beat there, and they're going to have their advantages both in UC and CD. Monotherapy, um, ustekinumab may be our first really valid monotherapy because it's less immunogenic than the other molecules. Certainly for fistula and extraintestinal manifestation, severe extraintestinal manifestation, uh, I think that both TNF antagonists and usta hold uh, sway there as well. So you can imagine, all of these drugs are, are first-line agents, and we're going to have to work out where they fit. So with respect to positioning, I, rather than picking out which drug is for right disease, remember the lessons we've learned with TNF antagonists over 20 years. We need to use these agents early, 
High-risk patients need highly effective therapy early in the course of the disease. Immunogenicity is an issue with all these agents, and the combo-mono debate is not going to go away. My own particular bias is for all these agents, if we look over the next 10 years, combination therapy is likely more effective than monotherapy for all agents. That doesn't mean that monotherapy is not a rational strategy. And we should not forget the lesson that we've learned just in the last five years, that heterogeneity of pharmacokinetics and drug clearance is a really important determinant of response of monoclonals. And uh, we shouldn't revisit the mistakes of the past. So I'll close there. Thank you.